கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா அவ்வியபிச்சாரணி பக்தி சுத்தி அனநியபக்தி ஏகாகிரதா பக்தி ஓல் மீன் தி சேம் திங் பக்தி டு காட் வித்வுட் எனி அதர் தாட் ஆக்கிபாயிங் தி மைண்ட் நமஸ்தே வெல்கம் டு அவர் நியூ சீரிஸ் ஆன் அனநியபக்தி வி டுக் கேர் to prepare the context for this series. And we're going to be going very slow in the beginning because this is a really delicate and difficult subject and we want everyone to understand. So please be patient if you already know some of these things. And if you don't, if you have any questions, of course, you can always ask in the comments. So this is the definition of yabicharani bhakti shuddha bhakti ananya bhakti ekagrata bhakti they all mean the same thing and what is that pure spontaneous love for the self brahman that one who is everything who we all are and when we realize that then there's nothing left to do <laughs> but to love everything and everyone as one's self after all everyone loves themselves more than anything right so when we discover that our self our real self is the self that love blooms and blossoms and radiates into all encompassing great love for everything and everyone and this is called karuna compassion that's why we start off every episode of this series with this theme karunar means compassion avarar means ocean and karuduk means just by thinking gati nalgum gati means liberation huh? like in the buddha's the buddha's time they said gati gati parigate parisam gate bodhiswaha gate means going beyond liberation moksha freedom so freedom from samsara birth and death and the primary symptom of one who has this liberation is this bhakti this love and not egoistic love not a narrow selfish love but a universal and selfless love for all without distinction without discrimination so this is the primary symptom of moksha and that's why in the buddha's teaching metta is so important it's exactly the same thing <laughs> exactly the same as bhakti and especially ananya bhakti And what is that? Well, that's what we're going to get into in this episode. First, I want to just explain this is a series on the devotional teaching of Sri Ramana. Now, most of the teachings, most of the series and videos that you see are about his Advaita teachings. Very few actually talk about his bhakti teachings. but in his own life he gave the bhakti precedence over the philosophy so we're going to be going into this <laughs> it's a real treat for me and i've been waiting for this for a long time 
<laughs> but now that we have the context established, so the meaning won't be distorted, so we can go into it. So this material was adapted and edited from conversations that Michael James had with Sadhu Om. And why Sadhu Om is so important, we'll see in just a minute. And finally, um, we want to acknowledge the kind support of the Sri Ramana Kshetram, uh, Sri Kanvashrama Trust, for allowing us to use their <laughs> original texts and quotes from their published works. Now, Sri Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi was really a devotee. Uh, people think of him as a guru, as a saint, as a sage. Uh, he always had just the right answer for every question. But what was he really? He was really a bhakta, a devotee. And appreciating the full depth and richness of meaning of Sri Bhagavan's Tamil verses is challenging. Even devotees whose mother tongue is Tamil often need expert help to appreciate their finer shades of meaning. We can clearly define the meaning of many of Sri Bhagavan's philosophical verses, such as the verses of Uladu Narpadu and Upadesha Undiyar. But no one can completely define the meaning of many of his devotional verses because the meaning we see in them is a reflection of our state of mind at the time. I love to tell this story. <laughs> one time I was a pujari, a temple priest, and a couple came into the temple, a married Indian couple. And they requested that I make an offering. They gave some donation. And so I had everything ready. So I just began, you know, offering the things to the deities on the altar. And as I was doing the ceremony, of course, out of the corner of my eye, I could see them. And the woman was having this intense emotional experience. I mean, tears were flowing from her eyes. It was most beautiful. Huh? She was really into it. And the guy, well, he was like tapping his foot, uh, checking his watch, you know. <laughs> like, when are we going to get out of here? You know, that kind of a mood. So to the lady who approached with so much love, the deities were real persons objects of love and affection and devotion. To the other one who <laughs> was looking with a different mind, this was simply a formality, something he had to do to please his wife. And so he missed, he missed the whole point. And I think the same is true of people who approach Bhagavan's teachings only philosophically or to put it another way, whose main concern is selfish. I want enlightenment. I want self-realization. I want to be able to say all that cool stuff, just like Bhagwan or Papaji or any number of teachers out there. Huh? That cool Advaita come back to every question. Well, who is experiencing this? You know? But that's not the real thing. I got to tell you, that's just mental. The real thing is when the perception of oneness of everything arises naturally and spontaneously from the heart. And that is bhakti. And as we have mentioned many, many times, <laughs> in, especially in the esoteric teaching series, Introduction to Esoteric Teaching, that bhakti is preliminary and required background for meditation, raja yoga. And just like raja yoga, deep meditation is preliminary to jnana yoga. So, you know, you can memorize a bunch of comebacks and you can develop psychological manipulation to the point where you can imitate 
a realized soul. But you can never really be a realized soul without bhakti. Well, let's be very clear about that. If you don't have heart-melting, spontaneous, ecstatic love for something, <laughs> for someone, you ain't going to make it. Period. So, before you go into meditation, you have to develop bhakti. At least you have to be uh, situated on the platform of karma yoga and develop a service attitude. That's the beginning of bhakti. So we'll go into this in great detail in this series. Now, as we mentioned in the last slide, Sri Bhagavan's devotional poetry is very deep. It's hard to understand, especially if we're coming from uh, incomplete or insufficient background. But Sri Saru Om, whose translations we use in this series, was perfectly qualified to interpret the many meanings contained in Sri Bhagavan's devotional verses. However, even he never claimed to have expressed all the possible meanings. In fact, he sometimes used to say that a new meaning for a certain verse had suddenly struck his mind. So no book could contain all the possible meanings. How's that? Well, as we're going to explain elaborately <laughs> in a related series called Rasa Tattva, there are five principal flavors or moods of bhakti. Neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parenthood, and conjugal love. And then there are seven subsidiary moods, making a total of 12. So each devotee has at least one primary mood and usually more than one secondary mood. That means the combinations of possible rasas are very numerous indeed. In fact, I don't think they can even be calculated because devotees are constantly developing new ones. It's spontaneous, it's creative, it's original, it's individual, huh? it's personal. Bhakti is the ultimate creativity because you are creating a transcendental relationship with God. So <laughs> this cannot be contained in any system. I know I've taught so many systems and ontologies and this and that and relationships and meaning and semantics and blah, blah, blah. But now we're getting into the realm which cannot be described, which cannot be limited by any kind of words or belief or the philosophy in the scriptures or anything. It simply is what it is. So it cannot be limited. The meaning cannot be uh, enclosed by any system. Therefore, we have to learn the language of bhakti, that's for sure. And uh, in the future, we'll be going through devotional poetry by Bhagwan and others. And we'll be analyzing the rasas, analyzing the emotions expressed. And you'll see how complex and sophisticated it really is. Now, Sri Sadhu Om was so well qualified to interpret these verses because he was a great Tamil poet himself. Also, he enjoyed many years of close literary association with Sri Muruganar. Now, Muruganar was basically the first really qualified sage to approach Ramana. And actually, his questions and his humble requests were the origin of many of Ramana's most important works, such as Uladu Narpadu and Upadesha Undiyar. So if anyone knew what the intent of Ramana's words and verses was, it was Muruganar. And Sri Saru Om 
worked directly with him on the translations and publications of many of these books. But primarily, it was because of the depth of his own devotion and the authentic spiritual experience bestowed upon him by his Sadhguru, Bhagavan Sri Ramana. So in other words, again, this teaching is not knowledge. It's not academic. It's not theoretical. It's like a map. Nobody sits and reads a map <laughs> just for pleasure, you know, like a comic book or something. No, you read a map to plan a journey. Or if you're lost, to find your way. So the teachings of bhakti especially, because they pertain to the heart, are not to be read like philosophy. They are to be appreciated like art. So this is the key to understanding these verses that they are meant to be lived. They are meant to become a part of who we are. They are meant to be experienced and explored on the deepest level of ananya. So what is ananya? Well, there are three types or levels of bhakti, devotion. Vaidhi bhakti, raganuga bhakti, and Ananya Bhakti. In Vaidhi Bhakti, one follows scriptural rules and regulations to worship God, usually given or approved by the spiritual master. Usually they're found in the scriptures. That's the beginning stage, the neophyte stage, actually the preliminary stage to real bhakti. Real bhakti is Raganuga Bhakti where one realizes the specific form of God that is most attractive to one's taste and devotional service to God becomes spontaneous. Now, this is the real thing. What? Love cannot be subject to rules. The heart cannot bow to the head. Love or ecstatic devotion can never be contained by words, although it can be sparked, especially by beautiful devotional poetry, songs and dance, art. Huh? But to be limited by words, never. So the preliminary study of bhakti in the scriptures and performance of rituals and various rules and regulations under the direction of the guru is simply getting ready for bhakti. It's not even bhakti. Now, I know there are many people out there teaching that the perfection of bhakti is following these rules and regulations or that following the rules and regulations perfectly will be the cause of bhakti. And I'm here to tell you that is bunk. That is a misunderstanding. Because how can love come from anything but spontaneous attraction? Huh? You all heard stories of love at first sight. Two people see each other, something clicks, and boom, it's there. Huh? It just arises spontaneously in the course of their daily experience. So this kind of attraction cannot be legislated. You cannot, for example, create an arranged marriage, which is going to result in ecstatic love. It can't be planned. It simply happens when conditions are right. Like something else we've talked about, enlightenment. So <laughs> bhakti is of the same character. It's transcendental. And one has to find which form of God arouses this transcendental affection and also be able to identify the kind of relationship that brings it out so that one can cultivate 
this relationship and bring it to the highest stage of ecstasy. And what is that? Well, both Vaidhi Bhakti and Raga Nuga Bhakti are usually Anya Bhakti, where our devotion is to God seen as another, a different individual, a different being. But in Ananya Bhakti, our very self is the object of devotion, the self, huh? not the petty, selfish, stupid little mind and ego. Huh? I want this, I want that, gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give Ugh. Who could love that? That should be set aside <laughs> and rejected as an object of love. And only the self, pure awareness, objectless, eternal, unlimited, boundaryless, qualitativeless, uh, pure consciousness without any limitation should be accepted as the ultimate object of love because this is God. This is the root of all forms of God, the formless consciousness that does nothing, goes nowhere, never changes, is always the same, and within whom all the worlds manifest. This is the experience of the enlightened sage. And so this can also be our experience when we become realized. So, Anya Bhakti is duality, I, thou, me and you. Huh? And that's great. <laughs> it's a great beginning. It's familiar to us as religion, spirituality, and love of God, and like that. And that can be developed to a very high stage in Raga Nuga Bhakti. But Ananya Bhakti leads to non-dual self-realization and love for all beings. So this Ananya Bhakti is the real, the real target, the real goal. Even enlightenment is simply a step on the way. I remember when I was a monk in Sri Lanka and I had gone through all the Buddha suttas, all the Buddha's speeches and writings in about three years. And I had finally found an enlightened teacher and he helped me attain the four paths and realize the uh, samadhi and being beyond samadhi, the nibbana, nirvana. But I was still feeling incomplete. And that was because I did not have the proper object for my bhakti. My bhakti was still rooted in duality. I was still in an I-thou relationship with one of the forms of God. And yes, I had realized it and it was very pleasing to me and I was not about to give it up. But still, it was keeping me in dualistic consciousness and I couldn't fully let go. Not until I discovered this Ananya Bhakti taught by Ramana Maharshi that I was able to find the actual object of love, the self, Brahman, that which is everything and everyone. That's the real object of love. So how do we measure progress in bhakti? Progress in Vaidhi Bhakti is measured by how well one can follow the scriptural rules and regulations. But this is only preliminary. Love can't be regulated by external rules. In Raga Nuga Bhakti, progress is measured by the purity and intensity of the devotee's emotional ecstasy. This is real bhakti, bhava bhakti. Huh? Bhava means ecstasy. It also means becoming, but it also is a form of the word bhava, which means meditation. So this ecstatic love also leads to meditation, 
but meditation occurs without any will. It occurs spontaneously, without any ego, without any selfish motive. And that's why it's the ultimate form of meditation. In Ananya Bhakti, progress is measured by the degree of one's identification with and realization of self. This is ultimate bhakti. This is the real goal of the path. Because this is the only way you can get the ego out of the way and meditate without effort. Because the mind is naturally spontaneously attracted to the object of meditation by its beauty, by its pleasure, by its ecstasy. And this is the secret to complete self-realization. Bhagavan Sri Ramana taught that the only means to attain the supreme happiness of true self-realization is Atma Vichara, self-investigation or self-inquiry. Atma Vichara is the simple practice of keenly scrutinizing or attending to our essential self-conscious being, which we always experience as I am. The trouble is, if we approach Atma Vichara on an intellectual platform, it requires an effort of will, and effort is ego. Will is the selfishness. I am doing this, and if I am the doer, then I am different from what I am doing and who I'm doing it to. So if I'm loving God and I'm doing it as an effort, if I'm doing it with ego to get something, huh? in this case, self-realization, it will fail. It can only succeed when we are making our efforts spontaneously, when there's no ego, when the effort is not felt as an effort at all, but as pure pleasure. While Atma Vichara is an analytical process of Jnana Yoga, Sri Ramana also described it as a path of self-surrender or bhakti. We cannot fully attend to and know our real self, Jnana, without giving up the false fabricated individual self. So, this is the key. The only way we can give up the self is when we're so overwhelmed by transcendental ecstasy that we just forget all about it. Otherwise, as soon as we start to think, I, then the ego comes in. That's the old habit. To uproot this habit, we have to be carried away in a flood, like a, a tsunami of love, by uh, coming face to face with the real object of our love. That's the process of bhakti. So what is the benefit of thus attaining true self-knowledge? It is only when one knows oneself as self that real good can be done to all creatures on earth. How? Only when self-knowledge dawns Will the truth be known that we alone are the reality of all living beings? And only then will the true love toward all blossom in our heart. Until this self-knowledge is obtained, one cannot truly love all creatures merely by talking and propagating on platforms. A platform is a philosophical context, like bhakti, like jnana like the Vedas or the Upanishads or Vedanta. So just by all this talking and philosophizing, it's not going to happen. You can meditate for decades and not reach realization. Why? Because you're coming from the wrong place. You're coming from here. And that mind is the seat of the ego. So you have to get off that platform and onto the current of bhakti, which naturally flows in the heart. The Bible says, love thy neighbor as thyself. 
It is only when one experiences the whole world and all the souls in it as the first person singular, I am. That real love, a love for not another, ananya bhakti, will be achieved. So this is the secret and this is the key. And this series will be about how we realize the secret with the key. Are you ready? Aung Tatsa. Aung Harihi Aung.